16 artists who are participating. And if you haven't seen the exhibit in the gallery, in the uh, administration building, I would certainly encourage you to come and see it. Because it's pretty interesting stuff. You start with the cell phone photograph of what is potential. Uh, this, this, uh, this was in the LA Times yesterday. I don't know how many of you read the Los oh. Angeles Times. But it showed up yesterday. You brought it with you. See? I did. Janet has it with you. <laughs> and uh, there was a review uh, on the gallery. This is a very interesting development. It fits right into this idea of the democracy part of it. What is the democracy when it connects to technology? And in this case, I would argue it has a lot to do with the cell phone's growth in the work of fine art. So the next slide actually shows an interesting development that I found from this article, which basically says, uh, it's a four-hour exhibit at the Ham Hamilton Gallery for one night. So it's just one night for four hours. And then a student says, who was part of the cell phone show, 94 photographs out of millions, uh, wakes up each morning dreaming of photograph, photography. That's, that you can't ask for anything more <laughs> than a student than somebody who wakes up dreaming about photography. And it also connects to me to something about this connection between humanity and technology is what's the purpose of photography and what's the purpose of art. And I sort of have a, my own perspective about this, which comes from a great critic named Bill Jay, who argues that uh, the purpose of good photography and good art, the purpose of it is to make the photographer and the artist a better human being. That's the number one purpose. That's it, to become somehow better. And I think, and I think there's some seed in the potential of cell phone photography in helping us to understand more about each other. The next, uh, I have a little graph here, which I hope you can see, but you can see what about when we got to around 2000, the film use dropped down to 48 billion from, what was it, 86 billion? And then 2011, per year, 2011, we're looking at, uh, what is it, 380, 350 billion cell phone photographs, 300, 380 billion digital photographs since uh, two, during the year of 2011. That's a really phenomenal figure. So I think if you argue about democracy and what's the possibility, you know, that there's, a, there's an opportunity. The next slide also goes back to uh, where are photographs now being stored? Okay, on the bottom, the smallest <laughs> one, <laughs> you have to find it. The next one is Instagram. The next square is Flickr. But you know what the biggest one is? What is this? No, it shakes you out, right? It shakes me out. Oops, sorry, man. Come on, where did it go? Oh, I missed it. Somehow it got missed. But the, one, the, the big box, you see how little it is in that enlarged area? The whole big box behind this is Facebook. There are more billions of uh, uh, photographs on Facebook than anywhere else in the, in the world right now. Bigger than the Library of Congress. Instagram and everything else. So there's a huge, you know, interest in cell phone photography. And what's it doing for? And we know about selfies and pictures that take pictures of themselves and we'll have not a little bit of opportunity, but I mean just to talk about it. So I think it's a pretty clear picture that people are interested in photography. I just went at a wedding and you know everybody emailed me or sent me by phone cell photographs of myself and my family together at this, I mean, within 24 hours, I had all of What? How do photographers make a living doing weddings when everybody's taking these beautiful pictures and send them to me? I don't know, I don't have to buy them anymore. It's so kind of interesting, right? So I'm gonna start next, we're showing you something about Instagram. This, what do we think as a democratic opportunity for photographers? You look up here, these are all people who are have, like the first one, uh, Theron Humphrey, has following, 357,734 people are following them on the Instagram. That's amazing. How can you? The next one, Mike Cuss, is a web designer and illustrator. He's got 671,536 people following him as a photographer, as a cell phone photographer. Dan Rubin, he's a uh, photographer designer in the United Kingdom, 563,357 followers. That's fun, you know. And then Astro Dub is one of the newest coming up. It's, uh, she's got 155, 327 followers. That's sort of amazing when you stop and think that artists, if you were to count up all the people who attended the exhibitions, 
And I don't think we could get up to 671,000 unless you were looking at uh, Hockney or you were looking at some superstar or Van Gogh or uh, something before you see that many photographs possible. So the next, uh, so that's what I have to add to that particular uh, introduction to think about. And if you have questions, you know, raise your hand. And I'd like to see a dialogue. We just sort of hope that there would be discussion about what's going on rather than just sitting there passively participating. So don't be afraid to raise your hand and we'll open you up. Now, the first person to speak and present is our I colleague, George Well, where is the question? Yes. Uh, I saw something that said 360 billion photos. Yes. What's, what's that number for? For all digital photography. All digital, not film based, all digital. Digital photography, yeah. It's grown up and just keeps going. Just think about all the cell phones, you have all of the iPads. In fact, a friend just sent me a, a, a note asking me, how do I attach my iPad to a tripod? <laughs> 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 no, it's true. Right? I don't like these photographs, so you're not to talk about. That's all the digital photography that's been uploaded. That was one year in 2011, 360 billion. That's, that's like one, actual kind of numbers? Yes. Yes. Well, probably statistically determined, yeah. 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 Okay, so what we're introducing now is our colleague, uh, Karin Johansson, who is, uh, is in one of the pieces in the show, and I hope, Pastor, maybe she can introduce it. This is an interesting grid, and I have a series of photographs I'll just show you. So do you want to say something about it? Yeah. Um, first, I want to say I'm, I've been a photographer for a long time. I, <laughs> Uh, lived in Sweden and I went to a lot of photography classes and art classes and I was working with photography long before the digital revolution so I'm very much an old traditional photographer <laughs> that's, that's my what I've been trained in and I came to America in 95 to go to CalArts and have my masters there and now I'm a proud member of the photo department here at North Park. So that's just a little bit about me. But this piece, I got invited by John to be part of this iPhone uh, exhibition or cell phone exhibition and I have never really used my phone as taking serious pictures for any of my artwork before. I always been using film or other traditional more traditional forms of photography and I used to analog print black and white or color so this was a new thing for me and uh, I wanted to do it in a tradition like imitating kind of the kind of photos that I see a lot that you immediately think oh this is a cell phone photo so that's why I did the selfie photography and also because I'm very interested in the way how all this self-portraits changes your idea about yourself and how you can portray yourself and kind of create your own narrative and personality by whatever you post online can be your, I mean, it's kind of a marketing of yourself in some ways and I'm very interested in that, how that works growing up in a generation where you always have pictures from everything you do from not from when I grew up where we didn't have that so I don't can't really look back and see who I was what I looked like so much not as much as today so that's something that's really interests me so and also I'm interested in tourist photography and how you done and take pictures of yourself to kind of be able to spread out in the media to show what you've done and where you've been and it becomes very much more about the picture of where you've been than maybe that you experience where you were at that time because it becomes a little bit a part of building your identity in a way. So I took some pictures and I wanted to kind of do it with a little bit of a twist. I'm interested in Los Angeles history and I was interested in all these different places where you normally don't see any. I mean, there isn't any monument at these places where you can obviously see what happened or 
it's, it's not really any obvious mark there in these places, and they still had a really important uh, part of Los Angeles history. So I kind of used the hashtags for giving some kind of more of a description to what the event that happened at the place that I was <laughs> taking the pictures. Um, to tell a little bit of a story, or you can just, if you see it and you're interested, you go and you Google the hashtags and you go there and you will find more of the stories. So it was kind of point of interest that I was interested in, but also that I thought was fascinating because you would never know where these places were and it takes a long time to really find them. So. I have a question yeah. about the hashtag. Mm -hmm. So this is for Instagram, is that right? Or what is the purpose of the hashtag? The purpose of the hashtag was more like I'm imitating kind of a, um, the whole culture of the media or the social media and the cell phone photography. And I felt like it was a good way to kind of tell a little bit of the story, since the photograph doesn't really tell anything about where I'm at. No, sure, I'm just not knowing the it's hashtag thing. It's part of the Twitter culture. Yeah, it's Twitter culture. Twitter. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah, so Thank people you. do that and then you can Google it and everybody who's took a self-portrait can you. see oh, every yeah. other self-portrait. So who understands the hashtag out there? I okay, <laughs> somebody explain what happens when you add a hashtag to a word when you tweet. What happens? It, 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 it shows up it on shows another up, feed, right? Yeah, it, in this, it shows up repetitively. And sometimes for in Twitter, the hashtag, the, it'll take the number of... Oh, the search it. Yeah, it takes the number of teams and it shows the most popular ones, too. Yeah, and it's a way to connect with other people that have the same hashtag and or didn't taking a picture or a place where you so for instance if you if you tweet something Cynthia and you tweeted on your Cynthia tweet and you had a hundred thousand followers but you added hashtag to an image hashtag kitty cat uh -huh. it would then add that feed to other people's feeds that have hashtag kitty cat so it, it expands your reach. You know, I, there's a directory of like thousands of hashtags in Twitter. And, mm -hmm. and you can see the most popular ones for the day. Yeah. They, they keep yeah. running, maybe you can see the most popular ones. Also, they're starting to show up in music videos too. It's kind of funny that. Okay, um, are, are Janet, are you ready? Are you ready? This is Janet Sternberg, who is going to, as a piece, a 30 by 40 piece over in the administration room. And the first thing I would like to say is thank you to your party, to Karen, who told me about this show and brought my work to John's attention, to John for inviting me to be in it, and to what seems to me to be a marvelous community of photographers and people, just people. Um, I started out taking photographs 15 years ago in a way that makes cell photography seem high-tech. <laughs> I started with a disposable camera, and I continued to work with a disposable camera for a very long time until I would say probably the last gasp of being able to get them, and I had them stockpiled, and when I said get them, get them printed, et cetera, et cetera. And then I moved to the cell phone, I, I, which this is, obviously, or obviously me. Um, and I was thrilled with the disposable. And not because I truly believe in, in everything needing to be low tech, but for me, it gave me a whole lot of things I needed and wanted that I can talk about later. But one of the things was the pleasure of having it with me not having this big lens out into the world, just very quietly being able to have a tool that you know, nobody knew I was doing anything special, etc. And the cell phone has some of that too. And one of the things I do with the cell phone 
is in Mexico, where my husband and I have a home. I am a uh, voyeur of old cars, and I, I go down the street, and I, I, people look at me, but I think maybe they're used to me by now. And I'm always looking into these these old cars in a very snoopy way, and I have a big series of them, of which, whoops, the one we just saw, <laughs> the first one was one of them, uh, looking down into a car, that one. Um, and. Uh, Anyway, the, the only other thing I'll say about photography and in general is that it was a very great joy for me, who has always been a writer, to discover photography. Because as a writer, I always felt history in the form largely of other writers sitting on my shoulders. Am I as good as? Is this okay? Is this too much like? When I started photography at a later time in my life, I discovered the relief of not having that, not having my MFA. I'm actually associated with a school that does give MFAs in photography, but I did not go that route. And so the cell phone for me represents a larger enterprise, and that enterprise has freedom and play and one more thing attached to it. And it's a phrase I will use for, I, I made up just the other day, and again, ask me what I mean if you would like to, um, street photography, a spiritual practice. Because everything is on the street, I don't manipulate other than to enhance color. Lately I've begun to crop a little bit, but what I'm looking for and find without knowing I'm looking for it is what I think of as the gas the moment when the world is just revelatory, and you gasp, and you take a picture. That, that, that's my practice. Um, that said, I want to just speak a little bit more, kind of personally, because I'm intrigued by John's comment about making a better person. And I will confess that I have um, conflicts about this, not at all about doing it not the slightest bit, believe it or not, <laughs> but about its reception in the world. And this goes back to the democratic theme. The, the thing that John um, mentioned, this article that I, I saw also and brought, is um, I'm going to read you just a few paragraphs and you'll, you'll know what I mean. Um, and it talks about people having double lives, paid rent, being, you know, working in their own work at night. Uh, then they talk about, they, on that one night, they shed the reality of paying the rent. They also shed the names they were known by, and this was one night. They'd come together as a block from the beach as their alter egos. And then they give you what I suppose would be called hashtags on the people. And it says, those were the names printed in bold on the badges they wore on lanyards. Badges that flipped over simply said, artist. And that's the question I raise for myself. Um, is everyone an artist? The democracy part is beautiful and wonderful, but it does raise a question now about individual vision, collective vision, uh, self-designation, and I got an email from my brother-in-law of a picture he had taken, and he said, I'm a coffee cutter. And it was a picture of a church, and there was a reflection of it. I do a lot with reflections. And a little bit of me got annoyed, a little bit of me was amused, so the amused part went out. But it wasn't a copy of what I do, because just using reflections isn't the same thing as taking a picture with reflections in it. So at some level, I feel the artist is a special thing. And part of that special thing is the part of John's title that says magic. At the same time, it's a democratic thing, and that's a part of this. So I just raise all that to all of you. It may not be of interest to you. It may not bother you. I'm working my way through it. You know, I, 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 want, could you, I, have, I have a comment just quickly about this brain thing. The reason the brain is part of the title is because I got so tired in my entire life hearing titles that said the eye of the photographer, the eye, it's not the eye at all, the eye is an inadequate optical device, it's got sort of mucus moving, floating stuff, and it's horrible, if you ever, if you ever dissect an eye, I mean, go down to the Exploratorium in San Francisco and do a cow's eye, and cut it open, 
it's, it's not a very sophisticated piece of work. It's the information that gets to the brain, the sensor, if you will, to use it, or the processor. That, that's what makes the difference in photography, or in art, or in life, or in anything else. And that's why I couldn't, I had to avoid the eye part of it. And you wanted to ask something? I have a question, just, I mean, the people that have been trained and worked years as photographers, do you feel like cell phone photography is great, a great thing, now everybody can be a photographer, or everybody thinks they're a photographer? Do you feel like that's a great thing, or do you feel like it has hurt kind of the craft of photography, or both? That's a really good question. Yeah, because it's an extension. Of Chris, are you ready? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's kind of complicated. There's because uh, there are lots of different reasons to take photographs, right? So we some some of us just take photographs to document a moment or time or whatever. It's it's maybe it's an important moment. I mean, just not you know. Um, does that fit in art artsy category? Probably not. You know. Um, I suppose if you're like a news photographer, so you take photographs, it's different than if you're a sort of fine arts photographer. So the reasons you're taking photographs are different. So I don't know if everything's supposed to fit in one category, you know, but I don't know if that goes to democratization of photography. Um, I mean, we're, we're witnessing that now, of course, because everybody's armed with a camera uh, in this room right now, so mm -hmm. it has the potential to take a picture. So it's definitely has been democratized. Uh, we were Becky and I were talking about this earlier. I, I, you know, everything has been though. You know, music, literature, art, um, film, uh, all these different things. You know. um, but I, I everybody was, thinks they. It's really bad that you know that just just because everyone can take pictures doesn't mean like right. visual literacy has actually increased. Right. No, mm -hmm. exactly. Or that people know anything about images or are smart about images or. Or, or not taken in by images, um, or manipulated by images. So, so um, you know, I think there's still a great need to learn about images, just for that that reason. There, you know, one of the things that strikes me about that, of course, is that um, everybody can develop from that experience. I mean, they're not necessarily, but they suddenly like the dream, student dreaming about photography can end up going to school or can end up getting influenced by it. So it's sort of, it's like a training place, a, a, a boot camp to learn how to become visually literate and then develop their own work. You know? Oh, absolutely. I, I, this is Stephen Callis, who's the full-time faculty member here at Moore Park College, and uh, her, his piece is very, very uh, interesting to me. Can I just make a comment? Yes, please. I think in terms of the craft, of photography. I mean, I don't think within a cell phone that you can capture depth of field or that you can do the same sort of focus and effects with light that you can with um, a more sophisticated camera. Is that <coughs> true? Or you can capture it all with a cell phone? So getting better every day. Yeah. 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 The, pre also, the premise of my whole, uh, the whole, you know, my low res series is to prove that that doesn't always matter. Uh -huh. it's, it's not always relevant, you know. The and subject and composition uh, have not much to do with what it is, you, you know, you wheeling around, you know, a big cam DSLR, or, you know, the, the best equipment and all that stuff. It's, it's you know, it's, sometimes it's important, but it's, you know. But the thing that's happening in the industry is, of course, people now buy lenses to attach on their iPhones. And the tripods, and the technology. And special lights are being developed. Yeah. Special, the demand is coming for new craft <laughs> capabilities. <laughs> Stephen, you want to talk about this? Add to the depth of the field thing for oh. sure. Oh, just only because it's um, for me that was a revelation with the throwaway. <coughs> and the larger point is how a limitation turned out to be my way in because there is no depth of field in a throwaway, and I discovered that let me do certain things that I couldn't imagine doing any other way. And so I'm not so, and I mean technical things, even though they're not quote unquote technical craft things, but they became kind of a philosophy of seeing where things interpenetrated because they were all on one plane. So I, I, I just want to nuance that part in it, limitations turned out to be way in for me. I guess it's that question of what the purpose of the photo 
is. For me, for example, when I'm trying to document my sculptures, it's really important to be able to control that depth of field. And I don't know how to do it. I have to hire a photographer to do that because of the sophistication of that knowledge. So that's what I was asking. But if you're if you're going for a different kind of content in the photo, then then as you say, it's perhaps not an issue. Um, I came came up with this idea, uh, which I, I titled this uh, from a s series that I came up with. It's kind of a new series for me called Suburban Tragedies, mm -hmm. and um, it kind of came out of my own experience of uh, being a recent transplant to suburbia and, um, and readjusting to my new reality of um, being here. But that, I think, came out of this idea that, you know, photographers long been sort of taught, like, always to carry your camera with you and to use it as this kind of diaristic um, uh, method of communicating uh, about your life and certainly the cell phone for me has been this kind of revelation about being able to do that and being able to sort of visually communicate ideas through the medium of texting um, using the phone to sort of sending a note but then being able to send a picture with it that communicates something more than just words could um, that sort of, for me, um, uh, fueled that, that idea that I could use the camera as a way of communicating and documenting um, aspects of, of my life um, as they've changed um, by moving to the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> with great experiences and tragedies. <laughs> yeah, and so I sort of imagine this um, series as uh, uh, not only sort of documenting things around my house, but also through the neighborhoods of things that I consider to be suburban tragedies of maybe maybe be architectural or um, some other form. You know, isn't another thing, another thing apart about your work and well, every photographer's work is the concept behind the kinds of things that are exciting to you that are necessarily beginning to be visual. Mm -hmm. And you take photographs that interpret those concepts and you then connect meaning to it. And that's, that's why the brain is in the title as well. Because it's not a brain about just craft. Craft is the learning beginning part of, of art or photography. It's then the ideas that you have to somehow express and want people to see and so have response to. Yeah. The inside of that ear is so beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, besides being sort of hor horrified by the behavior of my dog, um, mm. at the same time, um, there's a, a certain beauty and, and, and this follows, I think, a tradition in photography of photographing some things uh, that are finding beauty in things that like people might, might not find beautiful. I'm going to move on to uh, Chris. And I, I, I don't know who was showing up, so I had everybody's work here. Uh, the previous work is Dan Winters' exhibit in the gallery. But I expected him to show up from Austin, Texas, but he didn't. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, you never know. He's in Los Angeles. Yeah, sure. Sure. So this is uh, Chris's work. With... Yeah, so. Um... You want to see the three I have before I you know, maybe yeah maybe run sure. through? This is a certain I guess. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny. And they were that good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that last name is Ocasek. That T is silent, so it's, it's a bit like John's name. Immediately <laughs> obvious how to pronounce that. Uh, it's interesting. I've never met. Uh, is it Andre? Is it Janet? Yes, I, I never met you before, but your story sounded quite similar to mine. Oh, yeah. it's, you know, it's I saw that work before. I oh. just jumped and table, flipped over it. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. I, you know, uh, so like you, I guess I, if I, if I understand you correctly, sort of, this is me sort of uh, wandering around uh, LA uh, and find, you know, finding moments. Um, this, these three are part of a larger series called Low Res. Um, they're probably 
it's probably over 100 now. I mean, it's not, not that every picture I take uh, goes into the series, but, you know, I'll find, I'll find images and edit, uh, are appropriate and put them, put them in the series. Um, a lot of these, most of them actually are the early, early iPhones. So this three and, uh, you know, I, you know, I obviously still take them with the photos with the five, but I haven't, uh, I haven't looked through what I've got lately, so I, I don't know, maybe some in there. Uh, we'll see. Anyway, um, so yeah, this is me just sort of uh, wandering around the city, and um, you know, I just love the fact that uh, I don't need to carry gear around. I, uh, you know, it's, uh, I just I just have this little, you know, and we all have it. You know, we just pull it out and just take photographs. Um, so uh, most of these are exterior. Um, it's funny that we. Have the two that are, you know, or, or so that are in, inside. So the, the, the uh, chair was one, and then closed the donuts. And oftentimes, like this, to me, I sort of joke around about this one. I maybe have OCD or something, but it's things like this where I'm like, I don't really, I wasn't really seeing donuts here. I mean, obviously the donuts, but to me, it was uh, you know, nine circles in a box. Um, and I, you know, I'm just drawn to symmetry and, uh, and proportion and. Uh, color, obviously, and all these different things going on, and uh, so I, I thought I found a moment there. Um, and this, um, it's hard to remember where some of these things were taken, um, and what they were. I think this was probably some portion of a piece of garbage or something like that, and I just, I saw an element uh, uh, in garbage place. So. It looks like a shower curtain. Yeah, yeah. It might you know, it might not have been it might have been more of a curtain actually now that I think about it. <laughs> and and I think, you know, now it's sort of coming back to me now. Um, I think what's behind there is a box, a cardboard box. So you sort of get um, this diffuse um, light from, from behind the, the curtain. There's a question over here. I have a question about the first one because I I can't figure out how you got the lighting Yeah, well well that's, that's, that's that's a funny one. Uh, that chair actually is lit. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't Photoshop that. Uh, <laughs> it's a found object, then, right? Sort of. Yeah. Well, it's it's actually uh, it's it's everybody can see it. I mean, it's in a hotel. It's right. just it goes to that narrative of me walking around the city. I mean, I'm you know I see that I'm not going to like not take a picture of it. You know, it's like um, so. You know, this is my, I guess in a way, it's not even, you know, it's an interpretation, it's just my angle and view of that picture. Black background for it, how was that? How yeah, that's also, it's it's in a dark corner, and it's in a chair. And I, I, forgive me, I, I forget who made the chair, I, I would tell you, but I forgot who made it, so. Um, but he's a, uh, he's a designer, so. I have a question. Yep. Um, so the images that we're looking at, did you, you didn't bring them up in Photoshop, you like edited them off your phone? No, no, in like fact, I, I avoid that. Uh, yeah. I don't use, uh, you know, apps on the phone. It's, it's not that um, I really have anything against those sorts of things. It's just not really the look I'm, I'm going for. Um, so uh, what I do do, though, is I do bring, uh, so I, I basically crop in the phone. So I, you know, you know, I, my zoom is my feet. You know, I kind of go in and out, find right. the shot I want, <clears throat> and then when I get home and you know, I, I bring it into Photoshop, and I will do a few different things. I'll uh, uh, just white balance and, and uh, you know some color correction, and then I'll crop. Um, and obviously, I, I love uh, the square format, so I you know I stick to that. So usually, I end up cropping off a bit of the top and, and the bottom. So I have a little room to, for, you know, to, to find just the perfect, uh, what I think is the perfect representation of it. Uh, yeah, do you just print them on a big, huge... Yeah, so I have my own uh, large format printer, and uh, again, the series is called Low Res, so I'm really celebrating low resolution. I, these are pretty low resolution images. Um, I should also say, uh, I, I'm an art director, and, Big artists in the video games industry. I've been doing that for 17 years, and really, every everything we do in, in the games industry is low resolution. You know, even we. Uh, I mean, resolution is, is getting 
higher and higher over the years, but it's but it's still pretty pretty low res because uh, you can only fit so much data on the disk and, and actually stream it, you know, at one time. So um, so with games, I mean, you know, when you're playing a game, you know, you're not thinking resolution. You're thinking, is this fun or is this is this something I'm interested in? Am I engaged? You know, you're not thinking, you know, okay, this is going to be high res or you know. You know, look at details, composition, all these things. That's one of the things, or some of the things that make a great game. Obviously, story and all that sort of thing. I think, you know, you can see some of that in here too. The story and the, uh, you know, the lots, lots of the same issues. You know, um, so I would say, I mean, I have a traditional art background, you know, painting and illustration and all that, but but this is also informed, I think, by my my working. <laughs> I was trying to tell you quick. Which is funny. Which of my wife hears that is going to be hilarious. We have to have that taste, Michael. Oh, wait a second. No, no YouTube. Oh, I did want to show this one. Uh, this is a piece by Matt Mahern, if you look in the gallery. It raises a question about where are we going with, uh, see, the cell phone div div uh, video. Where are we going with that? And so Matt's piece, the, print, the piece you see up hanging in the gallery, is a print. And the DVD is a movie that talks about how the photograph is disco discovered. Where was the subject? How did you find the subject? And uh, Matt is a filmmaker and a still photographer and an illustrator. And in fact, he did a lot of work for YouTube. All the video, he's an incredible artist. And I thought this was a very interesting introduction to our program because we keep talking about, we're talking about video in the still photography. People have to know more about video because that's something that's happening everywhere in the industry for all, all uh, photographers. So the next uh, series are mine, and I'm going to go relatively quickly through mine. Uh, I'm, I, I just, I'll read with you a quote, and then I'll show you them slowly. This is my, uh, the quote that came from an artist I have a great deal of respect for, Emmett Gowan. He says, photography is a tool for dealing with things everybody knows about, but isn't attending to. My photographs are intended to represent something you don't see. And so it represents to me, for instance, uh, I get up and I go have to go drive children to school every morning by 8 o'clock. And when I get home, I go for a walk. The, the light is beautiful. Uh, it's, it's just rising. And I start looking for possibilities. Or when I'm walking into my uh, bathroom and there's a sunlight right behind me. This is one of my favorite photographs. I suddenly noticed that there was this incredible piece of art happening in front of me. It wasn't me, it was the art, and it was the sun coming in, the reflection of the window, and the puddle of water from the faucet. And I, if I, by the time I went out and get my camera, my DSLR, and my tripod, uh, the light would change and I would never get this photograph again. It wasn't possible to capture it. That sort of intrigues me. And I love this one. Uh, a lot of reasons for this one, but the most important one, I think it was, the, it was a quotation from um, uh, Howard Nemiroff, who's a poet, who said, nothing in the universe can travel at the speed of, there is nothing in the universe can travel at the speed of light. But everybody forgets that the shadow moves at the speed of light as well. So light and, sound and, and, and uh, light and shadow are equally on the same level. So, and the last one is a, a photograph of mine that I also very much from um, one of my walks, uh, early morning walks, or actually late afternoon walks, because uh, I was sort of uh, looking for something. And you never know what's going to come around. And once I had my camera, I mean, I had to give her my car to get it. And this way, it's right here. And the thing I'm impressed by is how large these photographs can get. When I uh, started enlarging mine, I see the possibility of enlarging 
bigger. But then I saw um, Janet's 30 by 40s, and I said, wait a minute, what, why am I fiddling with these little ones? But I sort of like the intimacy of having small prints anyway, so I had no plans to go larger. So the next uh, possibility here is uh, Becky Savelle. Becky, I wanted to say a couple things about the show, about a great, except for Janet and Steve and Karen and Chris, I think everybody else in the show is a uh, winner of the scholarship from the photo department or the art department. In fact, one of the candidates who is not here who participated, Roger Tully, was the first recipient of the uh, Arnold Phyllis uh, scholarship in 1974. So almost every one of these people were part of the value of the, a scholarship from our uh, department. And the part of this is we're trying to sell work for the purpose of raising money to offer more scholarships or just equal the same level in the future. So if you, if you see anything, you're tempted by buying it. Many of them are totally donated to the program for the scholarship, so the money doesn't come to the artists. In some cases it does, a percentage, but not money, much of it goes right directly back into our scholarship fund, which is something that you want to keep, I want to keep in mind. Becky Savelle is one of these people. God, we go back to 1974, 75? Uh, 79. 79. Is when I started yeah. school here. Yeah. 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 Back so. in the dark ages. And um, I just wanted to address your question or comment about the democratization of um, photography or image making. And I started working in technology and online industry in 92 when I was in New York. At that time, I was a professional photographer and had worked in advertising for many, many years. And um, I was thrilled because I think I secretly wanted to be a filmmaker and I thought I could never afford it. I studied with John, I, I went through the whole photography program here, I then went on to Art Center, got my degree at Art Center and then moved to New York and worked in um, advertising and, um, and editorial. And I thought when technology started to take off, I started learning Photoshop at the very early days and I thought this is awesome because for me I didn't care, I really didn't care if anybody ever saw my work except that I made a living doing it so somebody had to take a look at it. Um, I needed enough people to like it to, to give me a paycheck. But um, my personal work I didn't really care if anybody ever saw it. That was what was fulfilling to me. So I think that, that um, what you have now at your fingertips today as far as making videos, making photographs, making art, you know, making illustrations, whatever whatever you choose to make as an image and the tools that you have available to you are just outstanding. Uh, maybe you never considered yourself to be an, um, inclined to be an image maker, but you now have the opportunity. There's nothing standing in your way saying, oh, you can't afford to buy the film to make that film that you wanted to make or whatever the case may be. So anyway, I... Um, I started taking photographs when I was 12. My parents bought me a camera, and I tried all different types of um, processes and really ran the gamut. Went to Art Center, and um, as you may not may or may or may not know, but it's a very um, highly professional school focused on um, uh, mostly on commercial art at the time that I went there, and so. Uh, when you, when you go through all these different processes, you realize that when you decide to focus on a subject, you now get to decide how you want to portray that subject. So do you want to make this beautiful, unbelievable, fantastical um, world that if you think nobody's ever seen before? Or do you want to photograph real life just as it is? You have those choices. So for me, this particular series, when uh, John uh, introduced the idea, I had been um, training in Krav Maga, which is an Israeli fighting and defense system. And I was fascinated with the other women that I was training with who all happened in this particular series. And I have more photographs that are not shown here. But they are all very accomplished um, Krav Maga uh, um, fighters, for lack of a better term, and I wanted to discover more about them personally and their reasons behind uh, choosing Krav Maga. It's a, uh, it's more confrontational, a little more violent than your typical 
traditional martial art. And, um, and I actually didn't want anybody to know that I was doing it because I had conflicting feelings about why was I doing it. So I wanted to know more about other women and why they would choose to follow this path. And I wanted to show the personality of the woman and I wanted to really focus on their, um, I was hoping the personality would come through. I didn't want to focus on their body type, their shape. Um, I didn't want really the comparisons that we can't help but make sometimes because of the bombardment of advertising and commercial images of women. I just wanted it to be more about their personality. Um, I, once again, I chose to use the available light, um, so, you know, outdoor sunlight. I didn't use any special lighting. We didn't use any special makeup, hair or makeup. Um, you know, they chose what to wear. They chose, sort of chose their pose. Um, they chose their quote. I asked them before I showed these, Is, are you okay with this photograph and are you okay with this quote? Um, and they all said yes. And so it was, a, it, for me, it was a very fulfilling experience and a very um, enlightening experience in getting to know these women better. So we're sort of winding down, I guess, right? And uh, do, uh, do you have any questions for any of the panels? Anybody? Yes. I have a question for the panel. Um, for those of you that came up through traditional kind of photography, do you feel like the cell phone kind of revolution has changed, obviously, in the way that you are going from screen, taking the image, to working on a screen, manipulating the image, to printing it out, versus having the traditional viewfinder, to dark room, to chemicals, to paper, you know, like that kind of process? Do you feel like something is lost by not having that tangible experience? Or maybe you work in both worlds and you are able to kind of do both things? And I have to say that I, uh, Janet, your comment about the gas, mm -hmm. for me, it's just seeing that image. Um, I, I, I love going through all the processes, but I have to say I don't miss that. Well, it's a different about process. the anticipation. Like, that's how I was always constantly the anticipation of like taking the image and then waiting. You don't know what you're going to get. And then you see it in the dark room and it's horrible or it's amazing. Or, so there's that time that is not being lapsed, it's instant. It's still there though. It's still there. The time of always you spend in front of a computer monitor looking at your editing and deciding. I think that time is made up in the dark room. Yeah, yeah, there, from the, there's the, another thing though, that we, and this is this sort of a game thing that a lot of times we'll spend, uh, we'll spend a lot of time on a couple of pixels. And that, and that becomes, then you sort of forget the big picture, right? It's like the trees in the forest. Thing, right. you know? It's so easy to do that, to get lost in the pixels. And so um, maybe it's, well, I, I think that the darkroom experience is probably more rewarding than some of what we go through today, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it comes to manipulation. Having said that, mm -hmm. these I, you know, try to do as little as I can of manipulation. Um, but, but there's, to, you know, to but, go on to that, you really do have, um, issue that I raised in the email I sent all of you is basically that I think if you just keep it as electronically, which these 6 billion, 10 billion, 360 billion, where, when does the print emerge? And like we, my, my philosophy is that the students have to print their photographs, not just look at them on the... So what's, what's that experience? Does somebody have a different experience about how printing, looking at the print, and just looking at the electronic form on the monitor? Can I? Sure. Um, you know, going back, and first of all, I, I miss waiting a lot. I mean, yes, everything you're saying is true. I do wait. I harvest. I change. I look. I run through things. Xerox, with things, all that. But that first waiting was so great. Um, you know, and particularly in Mexico, I, I just would go in and I'd, you know, give them to somebody and. And I'd wait in the square, and it was really this sense of, am I going to get a present? Or like that? I, I just, it was lovely. But I, I, you know, something, I want to go back to some of the technical stuff, because 
Um, early on, maybe a little bit, you may remember this, Karen. You and I went years ago to some early, early lab, digital lab. And uh, we were there because there was some CalArts thing happening, whatever, you and I. And there was this guy who was really famous as a, a digital printer. And he was showing us around with great joy. And he was saying, see this blur? I can make it completely sharp. I can make it completely clean. Do you remember that? We walked out going, ah! <laughs> because that wasn't where. I, what I'm trying to say is, I think that there are fetishes in traditional photography. And I actually think that razor sharp vision, quote unquote, we don't see the world that way. So what's the big deal about having everything perfectly sharp, you know? We don't try to render as photographers the world as we see it, but some blur to me has a lot more to do with consciousness than razor sharpness because consciousness is much blurrier and porous. So, you know, you can lament all this technical stuff or not, but none of it finally, for me at least, gets to the heart of stuff. You, yeah, well, I, you know, for me, in my work, the scale and stuff, I mean, a lot of it's about proximity, you know, how close is the person supposed to be, right. uh, ideally, to the piece, right? So, um, I'm thinking often, you know, like if you go up to it and you're, and you're inspecting it from like a foot away or even a couple of feet away, then it even serves the point. Right. Maybe, I mean, maybe to like just look at it, yeah. it whatever, but, but it's really supposed to be viewed from sort of a certain distance, you know? Again, I guess I keep mentioning the game stuff, but that's kind of how the game stuff works, too, is uh, we know when we're making games that the viewer is like so far away from mm -hmm. or a certain distance from it. Or just out of the distance that are often the, uh, or thing, objects that are uh, often the distance can be much lower res because it's just the impression that it's not, you don't have to really like see all the details of the human Yeah. Are there any other questions? Because I guess we're running out of time. But is there any questions? Go ahead. Um, I don't know. I just think it's available. I mean, you always always have certain kinds of limitations. You're always every camera is has its own um, limitations and excels at certain things. It's not like you. There's never any one camera that seems to do everything that you would ever want to do. So they're just. It's just having like a another tool in the toolbox. Um, so. I find cell phone photography really good for certain things and maybe not so good or other cameras better for other things. I knew that I could go, go and get all of those different um, doodads if I wanted to, to emulate a, um, a different type of a camera experience if I wanted to, but I knew I was using the cell phone and I had a vision for what I was creating. For me, it, it, it all boils down to you now can create any vision that you can imagine in your head. You just have to figure out how, what tools are you going to use to create it. And how it's applied. You know, if I went to the Grand Canyon and I had a cell phone, <laughs> I probably wouldn't try to get a shot of the Grand Canyon with my phone. Unless it was for, yeah. like, just, it was to, just to document, right, just to document that I was there. But like what I would do is I would like try to go into you know closer to something and try to find an element or the you know something that I thought described the essential experience you know of being there without you know trying to capture the whole thing because I don't think the cell phone for me anyway in my view is good at certain things you know so I won't go there you know um, but I mean we all have different points of view I, I, you know um, so. These are yeah, so with, the, yeah, these are more t sometimes manipulated, right, right. traditional sort of uh, plastic camera manipulations. Like Mitch cool. Sandrio is. This is Roger Tully uh, using these diptychs of objects and then all the scene. So how's the diptych done on a cell phone? It's not. It's brought into the computer and then uh, yeah. some range, right? Yeah. Yeah, is it, I think the point of this, though, of this whole series is probably uh, 
photos that were born from the phone. Not right, that they all they were, and then they were like for their other or You know, Kari's work, the, the Japanese photographer, who right. does a number of books where he puts together photographs side by side, and it, it takes a long time for him to figure what to put next, even though it doesn't make sense to me always when I look at his work. So, but that's basically uh, most of the people that we uh, showed. I, I hope you had a good time. I hope you participated in that good time. The artists were very helpful. And I thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And then, then that says, I'm going to walk over to the gallery in a little while just to sort of, if anybody wants to answer any questions, I'll be there. If you, I mean, I think that's what I want to walk over. <laughs> <laughs> that's the